of a pandemic the epicenter where everything becomes so tragic we are so crazy we're zooming to you can somebody please come and save me so many people have really felt it it's hard to imagine how we will go back to living in New York City, the first place of everything we love. Okay, we're artists. Where are the venues? The freedom of speech and assembly. Okay, we found one. Cafe La Mama. So welcome to Copa Pandemic. Welcome to Copa Pandemic. Welcome to Copa Woo! Yes. All right, Karen. Hello, George. Hello, audience. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Copa Pandemic. And I'm Karen Finley, and this is George Emilio Sanchez. Hello, how are you? Hola, buenas noches. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing. I, I'm doing. Uh, I don't. You know, that's just how. When I'm, I'm so tired of when people ask you how you are during here. There, it's such a mixed bag, right? I, yeah. But I'm glad to be here, and it's good to see you. It's great to be here, and I think people are going to be in for a real surprise because. Uh, I think we've invited some special guests and uh, we're going to be talking about some really important, important things people are doing and how they can remain creative and have power and visibility for themselves and then for others with their projects. So I'm so happy to share this space with you. Likewise. And we, George and I have known each other uh, for some years and we're really pleased to be here at La Mama and to be sharing this time with artists and all of you uh, with New York and the world. So uh, we've got some wonderful guests and our first guests that we're going, their guests that we're gonna be, are we ready to, to bring in our first guests? Yes. Oh, great. Well, our first guests are from what, what would, uh, HIV doula do, and I saw their work that they were doing uh, about looking at comparing the language for with HIV and COVID. And this is a collective that is just so extraordinary. And today we have two members of, of this collective, J.D. David, and we also have Abdul Ali Muhammad, who will join us. So welcome. Can we all say welcome Woo! to them? And we're going to be Abdul. hearing. And it's hey, so me. great. How are you? Uh, tell us, it's nice to see both of you. And tell us a little bit about the collective and about this, what you're working on here. Hey, thanks for having us here. I'm going to share my screen. And tell you a little bit about what we're doing. What would a HIV doula do is a community of people join in response to the ongoing AIDS crisis. We understand the doula as someone who holds space during times of transition. We understand HIV as a series of transitions that begin long before getting tested or getting a diagnosis and continuing after treatment. We know that since no one gets HIV alone, no one should have to deal with HIV alone. We doula ourselves, each other, institutions, and culture. And foundational in our process is asking questions. I'll highlight that, asking questions. So we found ourselves here and coming up with 27 questions for writers and journalists to consider when writing about COVID-19 and HIV AIDS. I know for me, for a while there, it seemed like most people who weren't involved with HIV AIDS didn't know what shit was gonna come down with COVID-19, even the beginning of March. So, but we saw things rolling out 
And then some writers and journalists started asking questions of the same five to seven white cis guys and one cis woman about these, this uh, misunderstanding that HIV history is just one thing. So we know, we know the desire to compare COVID-19 and HIV AIDS is understandable. We know the response to HIV provides an inspiring roadmap for how to save lives, but we are looking at what was going on and what people were coming out with. And well, we have some questions. So we're here today to share some questions with you. We are not gonna give you all these 27 questions now, and there is not a quiz, but I'm just gonna drop a couple on you. They're some of my favorites. This is one of my favorites, 13. Will your writing consider the range of people with illness? Will it center people living with HIV and COVID-19 who are most vulnerable, at risk, least served and represented? How do race, class and gender analysis inform how you write about COVID-19 and HIV AIDS? Are the people with COVID-19 in your story all or mostly those who are ostensibly healthy and non-disabled at the time of the pandemic? Are your expert sources, are your expert sources people living with chronic illness or disability? How are your writing position people who are ill or who are placed at risk of illness? How do you resist the labeling of some people as a problem and others as a hero? Mm. You know, what I saw was that I wasn't the audience because I'm already sick with other stuff. And um, New York Times was telling us, you know, back in March, all we had to really do was, was uh, wash our hands and make sure that elder people were connected to services. We knew that wasn't right then. It's really not right now. So I'm going to now turn it over to my comrade, Abdullah Lee, um, who, um, in addition to being an HIV doula, also has written this important piece about if you're looking at HIV and COVID-19, something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, JD. And thank you to Karen and to George and to um, all the people watching this and listening in, and La Mama. <laughs> um, so JD has touched on the 27 questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about what inspired me to write uh, this piece for Race Bader. Um, and the title of it is, What Can We Learn from History of HIV Surveillance During the Era of COVID-19? The reason why this is so important to me as someone living with HIV is because uh, looking at the landscape, like JD said, of the news, right? Um, and noticing that people were highlighting um, the narrative of contact tracing, of using you know, um, networks um, to kind of hone in on COVID-19 infections, uh, networks of people um, and following those networks. Um, it reminded me of HIV criminalization laws um, and the history of that and the impacts that HIV criminalization has had on the most marginalized of us all, um, including black folks, brown folks, trans people, queer folks, et cetera. Um, and so it, it reminded me of, of the need to problematize surveillance because all of the news was mostly, oh, this is great. This will end COVID-19. Um, and so in the piece I talk about the, the use of archetypes to criminalize people or to begin the process of criminalization uh, because it doesn't happen overnight, right? First, it's those, those promiscuous gay people who have brought HIV onto themselves or it's those black people who aren't taking care of their health that is making them vulnerable for COVID-19. But what happens next, right, is, uh, you know, resources are sometimes given to those communities after a fight or after long, um, long movements um, uh, of, of activism. Um, but then the, the resources are tied to criminalization laws. And I just wanna give a little bit of history. Um, ALEC, which is an organization that makes template legislation for states to, um, to pass um, in their houses, um, was an organization behind template language for, criminal, for HIV criminalization laws. Um, they were the ones who also gave you template language for Stand Your Ground, which uh, we know about because of the death 
because of the murder of Trayvon Martin. The ground was also behind uh, HIV criminalization laws and making template language because when the Ryan Wright Care Act was passed in 1990, um, part, part of the, the way to access it, if you were a state, was to enact HIV criminalization laws, which tied transmission to, um, you know, to, to, or made criminal, made in quotes because oftentimes transmission didn't happen, but made the idea of transmission um, criminalized. And right now, what we see is folks romanticizing or talking about surveillance as if it's good or it's going to end an epidemic. And we know that one, it hasn't ended uh, an epidemic before, it has exacerbated it, and it has made uh, the most vulnerable of us more, um, more vulnerable and incarcerated. So that's a bit about that piece. Thank you so much for both of you for what you are presenting here in this important, crucial work that you're doing. It just is important and isn't spoken about enough. And we really wanted to start our show off with what you are doing. This is, this is important work. And could you please let our, uh, our viewers know uh, about the website too, so we can, um, and uh, also, if you can please uh, let us know, because we'd like to keep up with what you're doing. And we want, when we're writing about it, when we're speaking about it, that we understand and have a history, and uh, especially with these ideas of surveillance. And um, so th thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you so much for doing what you're doing. The work is really important. And we're so glad that we could put you on this so that people can be have access to it because it's so vitally important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Let, let's, uh, let's give a round of applause and thank you for your, uh, your activism and your courage and your inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Woo, thank you. And now we are very pleased to have another artist activist join us. And that is Viva Ruiz, who is also an, art, you know, an artist activist. And I've had the pleasure to get to know her this year when we both appeared with Andre uh, for an Andrea Dworkin event. That was so much fun. And you, you give me so much uh, joy, Viva. And uh, as I understand too, you you really have been touched by the by the virus in your own life with your own mother, and we want to send our love and uh, gra uh, joy with you because your mother is recovering, and so we're so happy to hear that, and we want to welcome you, uh, Viva Ruiz, uh, for also from Thank God for Abortion. Thank you, welcome. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. So nice to see you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to JD and Abdul. I really needed to hear that. Um, thank you for your work. Uh, I thought I would share just some notes I've made recently. Um, just some notes. And then we can chat maybe a sec. Uh, I want to time myself too so I don't get crazy. Okay. Notes on agony. Agony is a word I've been thinking about a lot in this, in the last few months, in the last couple of months, just since all this. Okay, notes on agony. Uh, trigger warning, suffering, uh, death, hospitals. On uh, calling 911, <clears throat> taking a deep breath, understanding that I have a job to do. Regardless of how I feel about that, Take a breath, more than, more than cry, something that's more than crying. Call 911, be on the video call, uh, removed, I'm not in the same house. Uh, nobody speaks English in the house, nobody speaks Spanish, an EMT or the hospital, mostly 
for my experiences in the hospitals too. I'm just gonna um, improvise and fill some of this in. Be on the video call, be the translator. No one ever speaks Spanish, why? Be, this is New York. Be positive and smile for mom. You are the coach and cheerleader, that's your job. Rewind. At the onset of pandemic, at the first mention, dread. Dread, knowing that she could not escape. Uh, my mother living with many of my migrant relatives in the same apartment. Relatives, my cousins, uh, my aunt, my uncle working in factories, working as deli at deli counters, working as pizza delivery people aka essential workers. Now those people are called essential workers. In and out of the same apartment with my 74 year old mom, diabetic mom, respiratory history mom, nowhere to run, dread from day one. Pandemia and it all did happen past that, now at the second hospitalization. The first day of the second part in palliative care, the doctor brings up the DNR, which I know from my father's illness uh, nine years ago, I know what that means. I stay calm, I stay strong, I stay positive. I explained to mom that she shouldn't sign that because normally she would, uh, seeing what my dad went through in his illness. And I know that she would never, she never wanted to sign a TNR. But I explained that this is different, that the ventilator is the next right step. And that's what is normal and it's it's what should happen next. And please don't sign that DNR. And having these conversations brightly with her, with the doctor in the room and translating. I explained that our cousin's mom is on a ventilator and they expect she's going to be fine at Montefiore Hospital. My cousin works there and he said, now a few weeks into this, people are coming off the ventilator more than they were in the start. I explained that to my mother. She's comforted that somebody she knows is on one and she agrees to not sign the DNR. So I explained that to her. I hear her fear and I pretend I have none. And in that moment, I don't because I just need her to know she can hold on to me. I'm strong and I am in some kind of control. And I, won't, and I won't let her go, even far away, that she feel me holding her. She concedes, we continue. She ends up being one step away from a ventilator for a week on 100% oxygen, being pushed through this mask onto her face. And finally, one day, she can tolerate a different mask, the next mask down called the venti mask and begins this slow stepping down of the oxygen miraculously. She's home now, coughing, recovering. My cousin's mom never was able to come off the ventilator and passed a few days later. Meanwhile, white people lounge maskless in Chelsea and McCarran Park. 40% of the wealthiest neighborhoods in New York City are empty. Meanwhile, peak dissonance, peak cruelty, peak evil. And somehow right now I'm valuing for the first time in my life, this thing called positivity. As an effective tool, for healing. At the same time, I don't see any of this getting better 
in New York or in the States. I don't see it getting better. And somehow within that, I'm committing to some new levels of brightness and relief. Mostly I'm tired, uh, but I'm committing to this, these new, uh, for me, positivity never really was a thing, but now in this sense, positivity and hopeless, hopelessness levels are high. Um, but I'm really happy my mom's home. So maybe positivity is pulling, pulling a little more weight. Ta-da, some notes. So now I invite Karen and George back in to chat with me if you would like to. Of course. Thank you, Viva. Thank you so much. Wow. Hi. That was so heartfelt and intimate and thank you for your generosity of sharing this your personal story with us and oh, there's a lot going on my heart just hurts for everybody there's so many uh, as we said there's so much anguish there's so much anguish right now and for me, it's like, it's, it's really peak dissonance that so many people are still not touched by this in the, in, in, in the same neighborhoods. And yeah, I'm at a loss to be honest, but. Uh, well, Viva, if it's a, the dissonance, yes. we see that dissonance, right? I mean, I was just talking to uh, my neighbor down the street who's a bus driver. And about, you know, she was upset because all these people were out without masks and her mother's asthmatic. And, you know, so the dissonance is something we see every day. I mean, yeah, and it, ways. Yeah, yeah. and it exists. We know it exists. We're not naive. This is the state. We know about state violence. We know about, you know, Black people are haunted by the state and never have not been. And, you know, migrant people are disposable to the state. They're uh, mm -hmm. siph siphoned from, and that's it. You know, ex uh, I think I have new levels of rage too, but I'm, I'm really not in touch there yet because the grief and the um, anxiety, ooh, that's a big one. And also the, the relief, you know, are so turned up right now, but I'm, a, I'm like, I'm normally a very angry person at rest, like my levels are in red at rest. So I don't know what's gonna happen to me a little even past this, but I'm excited to see, to be honest. <laughs> well, I, I hope that you're gonna be continuing to be making art and expressing and hearing your work as an artist and as a human recording and documenting what we're going through. I, I it has some because it's it's a human thing to do and I am touched by your your genuineness and not having a Pollyanna kind of you know the the inspiration kind of situation and I I find comfort in being able to have that space of what you're offering us to offering us thank you yeah. Karen you're your hat alone says so much. You know what? When in it doubt, maybe one word, but it says a lot. When in doubt, it really is about a look. That for me can really pull me through. A lip, a lip color, a hat, a chapeau, a look. It really can make a difference. Um, well, and, I, and I know about your rage. You know, I have Ecuadorian roots myself. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also uh, Guayaquil being uh, one of the other epicenters of this. Right. So, which uh, is, it is really just, was. Yeah. It's just a devastation out there. And, and I want people to understand, like, if you don't know, please know people are in, in yeah. agony. They're in agony. This mm. aspect of this pandemic that you can't be with your people is... Oh is is just i can't there's no words really to put to it yeah. um but anyway yes there needs to be art there needs to be some kind of like we need to get into these mm -hmm. hospitals and and reach 
um, yeah. everybody that's in there. That's that also is what I want, what I'm putting out there. Um, we need some more of spirit lifting in these spaces. Well, thank you, Viva. And uh, my heart, our hearts goes with you and my best to your mother. And thank you. You're such a vibrant person. And thank you for being so intimate with us. Thank you. Thank you, Viva. Thank you. Bless you. Bye bye. Thank you for the thank gathering. You. I might have to split because I'm a nurse right now. All right. But, bye uh, bye. Okay. Nurse Mom. away. Nurse away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. What a beautiful space for us to, that we're all, so many of us are feeling and then being able to express for us in, here in this yeah. room and beginning with looking at the language of COVID, illness, HIV, and then bringing to Viva's experience. Uh, it's, it continues here today. Uh, George, we have, are you, any comments? Are you ready to have our next guest here? Oh when, yeah, no, definitely. You know, I'm definitely ready, yes. <laughs> it's a total, the total counterpoint to this, which I, I love, because it's a, it's a switch, right? But it's beautiful. This is, this, our next guest is a, a switch, uh, is, is John Sims, and you can uh, go to his website too, John Sims Projects. And I would like to just speak for a moment about him. John and I have been friends and colleagues and artists. And today he is presenting his work, which is called Corona Killa. And it's a game that you play and it's a fine art video. And he's going to play it and share it with us today. And George and I have spent some time with him and we really were inspired by what he, about the dedication, how he's offered. So let's welcome John Sims, everyone. Hey. Hey, John. Hi, John. All right. Well, I'm about to share my screen with you guys and um, get crack -a And First of all, I want to thank, can you guys hear me okay? Is everything all right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay good. I First of all, I want to thank, um, Karen and George for giving me this opportunity to share my work. Uh, uh, this is, um, you know, incredible time. Um, and, you know, art is a very important part of, of being able to sort of um, help move through the space. Um, for the last 20 years, I've been very active in the fight against the Confederate flag on many levels, as I see as an object of fear. And, and like the coronavirus, fear is a very, very, um, powerful um, space to be in. And I me mean, personally, I found the process of art, the art of creation, the creative process has helped me uh, confront that fear. And so um, this Corona Killer Project is really about that. And before I get into the game, I really want to talk a little bit about what inspired that game. And it was a self-portrait. And um, this self-portrait um, is called A Date with Fear, a self-portrait in March, 2020. And, um, you know, I've lost uh, relatives to this uh, virus, complications to the virus and friends. And, um, and, and, and it's, it's a very um, crazy space because here you have this virus that you really can't see. And uh, so the fear is something you can't see like ideas, right? Like the isms, um, it's a very powerful psychological thing. And so uh, this inspired me, that dynamic inspired me to create this self-portrait with the idea of what would it be like to walk outside and see the coronavirus, these viruses as big as golf balls? And how would that in, in inspire or enrage or create a sense of uh, stabilization or destabilization and so I, so I ended up coming up with this piece, which is the idea to confront fear. And uh, if you look at this portrait, you'll see uh, in my glasses, you'll see that's the, the, the crosses from a cemetery. And then on the right, you'll see the globe, this idea of how this is affecting the whole world uh, coming out of this, the, 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 the death toll and, and, and how death is, is, a, is a way that unfortunately forces us to reckon with very, very important ideas on an emotional level. 
Um, then also you'll see the, the upside down uh, flag on the lapel. And this is showing how this image, this, this idea of the coronavirus and the illness is exposing the craziness of Americanism, American society, uh, the xenophobia, the racism, the sexism, the class warfare, the medical racism, and on and on and on. And it's turning our country upside down. And, and I guess part of the, even with all this stuff, I guess the mission, the idea for me is that how do we protect the love in, in, in all of this, how do we move forward? And this is where we have the rose. Um, so th this piece uh, really inspired this idea of how do we confront the, um, the, the coronaviruses. And I also want to give a salute to our immunity system. You know, those, those, those particles that are fighting every single moment to keep us alive and um, and so it got me thinking about you know, on that level, on 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 the cellular level of how this fighting is always happening uh, that that preserves our lives. And I think we we need to pay homage to to those uh, killer cells that that protect us in lots of ways too. So here I want to move into the game and uh, the John Sims projects. Uh, you can see here, Corona uh, Killer. And so let's, let's go right into it. If you go to this page, you can play the trailer and you can go right into the game. So we're gonna go right into the game. Service announcement. We click here. Coronaviruses. So I'm going to play an intro right here that uh, is is based on the self portrait. So now we move into the game. We have three levels. First level, uh, you uh, up to uh, 5,000 points. Once you get 5,000 points, you can move into the second level and 10,000 points you get to the, um, to the third final level. How do you get points? Well, you can shoot the bats. You can shoot the Coronas, obviously. You also have these uh, oxygen bubbles and life bubbles that give you life and, and energy, energy bubbles. If you hit them, you, you lose points. Um, you have two metric bars, one for your energy and one for your viral load. As you, so you want to keep your energy levels up and you want to keep the viral loads down. And then every so often, once you get over a certain amount of bars, you will get an opportunity to absorb uh, one of the um, medical icons here. 
um, to alleviate some, uh, to, to, to get rid of one of the viral bar. Here, after 2,500 points, you will, be, you will be given another life. So let us get into the game. but also I think the metaphor is very powerful in terms of this idea of being able to see the things that um, create fear and being able to confront them. Um, and uh, gameplay is a serious industry and another opportunity to use art uh, to do some of these more critical issues. All right, I want to thank you all. Thank you, John. That was just, this is really fantastic. Thank you. Okay. I was just wonderful. Um, I just, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's such an odd dystopian game and quality and everything about it. And it speaks on so many levels, the, you know, the commercializations, the war, you know, the war on COVID and right, right, right. you just, you make it and it, it it's, I, I hope it's going to be successful too. I mean, I could see, you know, as a strange. Yeah, right, right. John, real quick, like, what did you think of doing this, and how long did it take you to put it together? Well, here's the thing. Like I said, after I did that, um, the self-portrait, um, you know, this idea of being out. Imagine, you know, coronaviruses everywhere. You would, you know, your impulse is to get rid of them, to shoot them, to you know, to hit them away, you know, that type of thing. So. Um, the, the game came rather quickly. So I, I put together a really a good group of folks, um, a team of uh, you know, programmers and uh, you know, various uh, design folks and put this together almost in three weeks. Wow, you know, wow. Yeah, you know, working on it. Uh, and you know, there's a lot to go into this. It almost felt like you're putting together a film, to be, to be honest, you know. You put it together faster than the stimulus checks came out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's absolutely true and you know, my hope is that this is a, it's a way for people to take out the, the you know because fear creates anxiety and anxiety is a very a very you know interesting thing so you know if this can help folks focus that anxiety a little bit and also um pay attention to this this terrible virus that is yeah. serious and um and, and it seemed like it's here to stay. So we're gonna to have to develop a relationship. You, you know, there is a, a one comment here in our <sighs> chat, which says, I wish the human element was in there too, not just the bats. What do you, th what do you think about that? Of oh, that's, that's, yeah. Well, I think that, that, well, on a cellular level, I think that the cell, the killer, you know, um, the killer white blood cell is the human element. It's that, that's the part that protects us on the cellular level that allows us to wake up in the morning and not feel like we're about to fall over. Um, the bat, you know, is a reference to the source yeah. of these viruses. Right. And, um, and then you could also argue that the medical icon is the human element of confronting this, the, these issues, these health issues through science and through vaccinations and yeah. through medical deliveries. So I think there's some human elements. Mm, it, mm -hmm. it, takes, it takes a whole culture and a whole science to be able to galvanize, right? Um, to battle with this very small microscopic agent, you know, that 
that that sees no color in a lot of ways, sees no age, you know, it just comes in. And, and, you know, and as we find out more about it, um, you know, it will probably change and, and come back and come back. So, um, yeah, I, I totally understand the element of, and, and I think part of me, my intro, right, mm -hmm. is, the, is also a, a human element, me talking mm -hmm. about you know, uh, uh, creating a challenge to, to fight yeah. this. I mean, that, that's also a part of, of the whole game. Well, so. well, they, well, we can, I'm gonna, for time here, I'm gonna be having to yeah. leave it here, but this is so, uh, your work is, you, you know how much I love your work and you as an artist and also all of your work that you've done on the Confederate flag and the reclaiming and the recoloration is important work that you've been doing for years. And I wanna thank you so much for, your, for the work that you do and your commitment. And uh, thank you for joining us here thank tonight. Thank you, Karen and George, for having me. Thank you, John, and thank All you right. so much. All right, bye. All right, uh, there's, <laughs> we've, been see, well, we've been here for about 45 minutes and we've seen a lot of different things here. And that's, I am feeling some comfort here and I hope our viewers are and just being around artists and thinkers. And that's something that I have missed so much is going to La Mama and being in the audience, just seeing my friends and going to so many of the different performances, cultural events and just the transactions. So it's, I'm glad I'm being able to see some, some of you here tonight with us. And thank you for joining us. George, you, do you feel that way too? Or oh, no, this is like feeling? a blessing. This is a blessing. We all need it. We all need it. Plus I know what's coming. So I'm really, <laughs> really excited. And we are, who's gonna be joining us next is Dusty Childers. And it's such a pleasure for you to be joining us, Dusty. And we've known each other for, a, for about a year, and it's I'm such a fan of your work. And thank you for preparing something for us to, today. Welcome, Dusty. Hi. Um, okay. So, hi. How are you? Um, so, the thing that I am presenting is a video. So, I'm just going to intro it just for a, a few minutes. Uh, it's a short video. Um, so I am a person who has sort of um, entered the art, like performance art world through um, having shown up at events for years and years. I've been living in New York for 13 years. and just progressively sort of just like wearing, wearing things. Right? I've just been wearing things. And then eventually it became this, this moment where someone was like, oh, are you performing and then I was like no I don't perform and so basically uh sort of my public art is is wearing clothes right and so um at home locked in doors uh afraid for my life uh catching this this virus um I haven't been able to do that I mean you know there are people who have been doing really wonderful things like that about that putting up photos photo challenges I just couldn't participate um, because I need people to be, I need proximity for, for what I do with, with this. So um, I just was sort of inside and, you know, going a little mad, you know. And the thing that has really helped me is my dear friend, Machine Dazzle is, uh, is in Hawaii and um, has been foraging for pieces of natural materials and making these beautiful headpieces. You should look at Machine's Instagram and um, was sort of documenting making them um, by going on Instagram Live. And so I was like, it was like a little hangout. I could sit there and watch. And so I've been ordering, you know, I'm here in Brooklyn and I've been ordering shit on the internet like nonstop. And so it comes in and there's all this packaging. And so the packaging was making me feel crazy. Uh, but, you know, so I, inspired by machine, I decided to make something out of it, right? So then I made something out of it and then documented that and then made a video. So in collaboration with my boyfriend, Shane O'Neill, and my friend Bridget, who social distance videoed me 
we made a video. Um, and so this is <laughs> this is just in the words of my dear um, genius, um, the person at the tip top of my mountain, Justin Vivian Bond says, keep it pretty, keep it shallow, keep it moving. And so this is that. And just so you know, I put a comment, I'm gonna do it again. Um, there's a comment in Facebook. You can watch the so watch the video here, but there's something fucked up with the sound and we tried to troubleshoot it. I don't know what the fuck is going on. So it's a whole actualized thing with a beautiful soundtrack that we worked pretty hard on. And so watch it here and then you can watch it again if you liked it, um, share it. It's on YouTube, I just put the link. So I'm gonna do this thing now. I hope I don't fuck it up. So share screen. Okay, great. Okay. Hold on one second. Sorry guys. Um okay. Jeez Louise, it's a lot of work here. This stuff. Share screen. Okay, great. Here we go. Love you very much. Hope you like it. Know that the sound isn't perfect. I apologize. I'm a Virgo. Um Okay, so here we go.
Uh, wow. Uh, wow, you. Thank you, Dusty. That was Love just that. wonderful. It was just fantastic. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's just basically about, um, there's, there's a lot of, a tip for everyone who's doing a video, this is what I'm doing. You can't really do much nuanced sound, <laughs> um, unfortunately. So a lot of this probably got lost, but there's like all these beautiful sound clips that I went foraging for as an homage to like, you know, um, machine making these things. And so um, there's like the clip from Goodfellas where the woman is, yeah. Uh, the hat, I gotta go home and get my hat. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Anyways, it's it's, uh, it's magnificent. You are a Virgo. This is a fantastic <laughs> work of art. It it really is. It's it's the embodies this space of a strange sense of jubilance and freedom, but yet you know enclosure and the quarantine and how you put that together and still within this this fashion and making something out of the throwaway what's being discarded. Uh, is such a, then, a gesture, and then, he, and then he and then you discard it at the end. I mean, it's a, it's really, it's fantastic. Well, I learned from my roommate. I, did, I guess I didn't realize that, like, sort of a main. I mean, maybe I'm misquoting this, but like one of the main points of a mandala is to like make it and then and then and then get rid of it. And so yeah. the idea of like the um, you know spending the time and there was like all this video glitching that happened and like I lost all the video and had to start over and all this shit so it just seemed like there were a lot of things happening to sort of keep this from occurring and so it's it's kind of the it's kind of apropos to the time is that like you can't expect anything to just there's no smooth sailing you know so. <laughs> that's for sure thank you Dusty I love thank that you. thank you so much thank you for having me Mwah. And wow. we look forward to seeing more of your work and keep keep making art and having us feel and getting in, in contact with these, these feelings that are so troubling and ambiguous, but yet have jubilance to it. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I'll talk to you soon. Bye, Take Dusty. Bye. <laughs> oh my goodness. I I have a smile on my face here and it's so nice to be seeing the work that we're seeing here and also to be thinking of the energy that the artists here today of the time and the focus to engage in our evening here today in all of our different ways is yeah. you know just it's moving in its in its own way it makes me feel connected that you know the small gestures and the large gestures and everything but also to be in a time where everyone has been so challenged that hopefully we're a little more open to other experiences other imaginations other perspectives and sort of see these everybody doing what they're doing facing the same thing it's really you know it's eye opening it's comforting i don't know Thank we have you. Else yeah. up, we right? have something else coming up. And, and before we're going to do that, I want to take a moment out to be thanking people here too before at the end, instead of having it at the end. I just really want to be thanking La Mama, the incredible staff here, the technical support, and everyone that has been working so hard, and the audience, the publicity, everything to be making it together, because we're all just working here, just kind of making this happen. And I appreciate all, all of your work that you're, you're doing it. And thank you. And I also want to be thanking uh, the work that I, for our opening intro video and music that was uh, made by Violet Overn and, and Casey Wyman. I want to thank you for your work. So let us uh, have our, our is that our last guest here? Well, our I guess next we're guest. our next our guest. Next <laughs> and hey, I think that it's Pamela Sneed. Welcome, Pamela. I'm coming. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> it's so good to see you. Well, we don't see her yet. Oh, we don't see you yet. Well, it's so hey, good to hear you. you. Oh, there she is. And I want to get this out too beforehand. Is Pamela is an extraordinary writer and 
has a wonderful book that's out now, Sweet Dreams, but there is a wonderful book that's coming out in the fall with City Lights Books. And make sure to look for that Funeral Diva, which I'm reading now as a, just because I'm, I can. <laughs> so welcome, Pamela. Hi. Hey, all you radicals out there. <laughs> good to see you. And uh, thank, we'll, thank we'll... you. It's good to see everybody. Thank you for doing this. I feel like we should do it every week. We need the COVID cafe. Um, we do. And uh, yeah. Would you like to read? What would you like to present today? You're ready to present? Or uh, I am. I'm going to read uh, a piece called The Tale of Two Pandemics. And um, it's from my book, uh, Funeral Diva, which is coming out with City Lights. And if you go to the page uh, at City Lights, you can sign up for an alert for when it comes in. And also my watercolors are the background. And uh, basically it's all about incarceration and it's, and it's called a quarantine quilt. Speaking of COVID-19, the headline in yesterday's news bladder tale of two pandemics Shocking inequities in the healthcare system. What got me was the use of words shocking in two. Those of us who lived through the 1980s, early 90s AIDS crisis already knew about the existence of two New Yorks, two 20, 30, 40, 50 Americas, maybe more, depending on age, race, class, citizenship, citizenship status, entirely different systems for those who aren't white, straight, middle class, those of us who saw our brothers, friends, sisters die at the hands of a system that shunned, refused to treat, threw away the unwanted, still can't forget a gay friend waiting for Medicaid to treat HIV. It was weeks, he got sicker and sicker. I asked what took so long with Medicaid. He said, they're waiting to see if I die first. That wasn't the America that I learned about in elementary school, whom I was instructed to put my hand over my heart, stand for and salute. This wasn't the free America we sang of. People who are LGBTQI already know that there are two Americas. A doctor who kept forcing me to take a pregnancy test even after I insisted and blurted out at the time, I only have sex with women. I saw his scorn, still a test he made me pay for. And then those women who were forcibly sterilized had their wounds, their life force taken, left dry, barren by doctors who never even stopped to explain, felt entitled to take, scar women's bodies, breasts cut off, no options or consolation given. Women who aren't rich and white already know invisible lines you can't cross with no insurance or Medicaid forced into black markets for drugs, a land of botched care, botched procedures. Black people already know separate doors, separate entrances, treatments, options, existing long after Jim Crow. And I have waited for this moment, this time of a medical me too. When those who suffered from botched procedures and the indignity, indignity step from shadows speak and name the atrocities committed, medical malpractice. I won't blame all doctors, some are good, just middlemen like so many in a broken system doing what they can. And I'm grateful for the ones, for the good ones in this pandemic risking their own lives. But the image of doctors we see in movies and on television who understand a complex problem, pour through the medical books and science, read through night under dull lamplight to find a cure, whose eyes weep with concern are mostly false. Uh, rare, like the ones who find a cure and refuse to patent or personally profit. Those days have become a myth. What's replaced them now are businessmen wanting status amongst peers, entry to country clubs and power, gaslighters, hustlers, and actors like Trump. There's a doctor at Mount Sinai, star of his field charged with drugging and raping his patients. No one believed it until it was proven. His victims were only Black women. The rest he left alone. A tale of two pandemics. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> Pamela. <laughs> Miss me. Wow. Hey. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, it really, it's it's so true. It's so, I'm kind of like just speechless and you putting 
the words to what is happening here and to the realities of what what we're living with and and also seeing your quilt behind you beautiful just thank you <laughs> thanks let's keep doing it thank you speaking truth to power <laughs> truth to power thank you for the work that you do and you're always a voice and you you speak up and out and and your passion and the way that you feel for 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 humanity is inspiring for us here and i want to thank you for for the work that you do and that you continue to do when it's so difficult during these times but, and and your great and your gracefulness thank you and, and before you both real quick i'm going to include you on this one karen for karen and pamela you know because i've done this 24-hour event the last three years on gun violence and pamela's been there all three years you've been there the last two years and uh it's just you're both so powerful but pamela your words you always do this you always you wake people up you know it's just mm. powerful and uh you know what like karen said just really want to thank you and thank you for all your work yeah, well, the same, you know, I'm glad that we're all here and that we're doing this. And I'm like, looking to all my peers, you know, I mean, we are the essential workers. Um, and <laughs> uh, yeah, along with others. And, uh, and it's important that that's recognized. And I'm really grateful for everybody on this program and for the two of you, because you always inspire me. And I have people to be radical with. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I just want to just also thank, um, real quick, I want to call out, there's so many people, and uh, I'm going to say Violet and Casey because they helped me with the music for my opening theme song that I thought was never going to work, and they made me feel like it worked. So I want to thank them for the music. Uh, I want to thank Chris Ignacio specifically from La Mama, who has been a real angel in, in supporting us and doing this. And we came at him with a lot more than you first demand. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I want to thank you, Karen. I want to thank you. you you've been, it's been this You're welcome. incredible. Thank you. We wanted to do this, but I didn't imagine it would be like this and that it would be not just us, but it would be a community of, of people that are all fighting the fight and, and facing the struggle and learning how to continue to transform. So I want to thank you. Um, George, it's wonderful to be here and spending this time here with you and with the other artists. I feel, I feel less disconnected. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes. Oh, so I just say is that now we're going to, I guess now it's coming to sort of towards the end of our evening here. And our end of, I want to thank all of our guests. Thank you so much for, for joining us and preparing and taking the time out. And we know how much work it is to do. And it, all of us, the cognitive, just being able to focus and doing it. So thank you for putting yourself out for, for your originality and dedication. And what we'll be doing is George and I have, uh, duet that we're doing in a way, a diptych, and George will be giving some final words. And uh, I have a video here of artworks that I've been making, which are words of the epidemic that I've just been focusing on. And we have a short film that uh, Violet Overn has put together and with Casey Wyman. And so I appreciate that with their music behind it. And so let us continue here and thank you everyone for such a wonderful evening here. I invite everyone to close your eyes. We have been here before, not the we of we the people, but the we of never good enough. A pandemic is not new, nor will this one be the last. Dust to dust, eye to eye, day by day, moon tide by moon tide, sunrise to sunset. The times, they are ablazing. As the search for a vaccine for COVID-19 continues, 
The question remains, when will we find a vaccine for the invisible enemy that continues to allow people to believe what they see? Like the lines on a map and not see what is hidden by those lines of division. Decolonization is not a metaphor. Facts are real. Believing is seeing what is not there, but what is right here. Now open your eyes, look around, see?